Today we're concluding our series, Interrupted. How do we interrupt the, the thoughts that kind of drag us down and wear us out in our lives? And uh, this morning we're going to talk about interrupting uh, guilt. How do you interrupt thoughts of guilt? And uh, there's a passage in Scripture that's considered like the premier passage on dealing with issues of guilt. And we're actually not looking at that. We're looking at uh, a not as well-known passage that addresses issues of guilt. And you'll kind of see why as we go along this morning. It's found in Psalm 50. In case you're wondering what that most famous passage about guilt is, it's Psalm 51. We're backing up one psalm and we're looking at this. And it says, this is what God says, I have no need of a bull from your stall or goats from your pens, for every animal in the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountains and the insects in the fields are mine. How many there are some days you just wish you would take them back, those insects? And if, you, if I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and all that is in it. Do I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Sacrifice thank offerings to God. Fulfill your vows to the Most High. And call on me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you will honor me. Uh, to deal with issues of guilt, it's a lot like dealing with issues of worry. The more you tell someone not to do it, the more they tend to. If you tell someone stop worrying, they just worry even more. And if you tell someone stop feeling guilty, they feel guilty even more. And when we look at how God deals with issues of guilt, we're going to talk about some things that are not obvious to us in the culture in which we live, but they were very obvious to the people to whom these words were written, and it will help us understand the context. A lot of people wonder why Jesus dying on a cross was necessary. I mean, can't you forgive someone without someone having to die? I mean, don't we do that? So why couldn't God just say, I forgive you? And the challenge is, is that often we only view the cross as as punishment, that there's a punishment that's happening for sin. And here's the thing. If you only see the cross as a place where punishment occurs, that will not make you feel less guilty. In fact, it might even make you feel more guilty. So we need some additional meaning. So what was the concept or the understanding of a sacrifice in the ancient world and in the Old Testament? And the first thing I want you to know is a very common thing uh, in fact, there was a constant slaughter of animals all through Scripture. Moses actually provided specific instructions, but that sacrifice started with Cain and Abel, and it continued on. And by the way, Judaism was not the only practitioners of uh, sacrificing animals. In fact, every culture of the ancient world did. It was a universal system. And the, the question is, why would they do that? And uh, there's a couple of things that I, will, I, I think will help us understand this. And the first is that sacrifices were considered a means of transfer. A means of transfer. In the ancient world, people noticed the difference. They, they recognized the connection between the death of an animal and your ability to live. Now, if I want a steak today, I can go to the local local supermarket and I can find a, a beautifully trimmed and neatly packaged steak in a cellophane container and I can bring it home and put it on the grill. Uh, back then, if you wanted a steak, you had to go butcher a cow. And uh, how many are glad that you don't have to do that now? Let's just check how many might eat a little less meat if you actually had to, yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't, it would take longer too. But this is what they understood. If there was meat on the menu, an animal had to die. And for them, it wasn't just the death of the animal. It was like life had transferred because the animal had life and sacrificed it. Now I am able to have life and continue to live. So life actually came out of death. That's why in the ancient world, meals are considered very sacred. And even today, we ask the blessings, but we're far removed from that understanding that there actually had to be a transfer of life. There's a second concept about sacrifices that will be very helpful for us today, and that is sacrifices were considered a means of connection. Connection. 
In the ancient world, people believed that there was more to the universe than just what you could see with your eyes, touch with your hands, hear with your ears, or taste with your mouth. They believed that there was something intangible and invisible, but it was still real. And they believed that the way you connected to that invisible and intangible world was through sacrifice. They believed that sacrifice was how you made that connection. So to us, sacrifice means a very different thing. Uh, some of us will sacrifice dessert to lose a few pounds. Uh, you might sacrifice your car. You might sacrifice your money. You might even have to sacrifice a limb of your body. And in every single one of those examples, uh, to us, it all means the same thing. We lost something. But it, to the ancient world, it's not how they thought about it. They saw sacrifices as a way to connect with God. And even in the book of Leviticus, 16 times it tells us that the aroma of the sacrifice was pleasing to God. So if you take that steak that you got at the local supermarket and you take it home and you put it on the grill, how many know it smells good? And, and how many of you have ever been uh, out in your backyard and then you smelled what the neighbors were cooking on their grill and you knew it was going to be better than what you were getting? And, and you just thought... Man, I wish I was over there today. But of course, you don't say anything because that would be unwise. But people in the ancient world, they, they, they had a sense that that aroma was pleasing to God. And they, they understood that while I am eating the meat, I'm doing so in the presence of God. So as it turns out, those two concepts were very important concepts. But the way the world understood them was completely wrong. And God does this amazing thing where he helps them to re-understand the concept without throwing it away. God does this brilliantly. And so he's going to teach us through this concept of sacrifice how we can actually be released from and remove guilt in our lives. And it starts with something that may sound strange, but it's really important. And that is, if you want to remove guilt, you need just one God. Now, let me explain this. In the nations and the cultures around Israel, they had many, many gods. There were all kinds of gods for all kinds of reasons. And by the way, they were kind of geographically located. So the gods in this village might be different from the gods in the next village. And their concept of gods is that they were kind of like humans, just more powerful. They had special abilities. But they did believe that those gods were still needy. In fact, they believed that the gods created human beings because they were hungry and they wanted human beings to, to prepare food to feed them. And they also believed that these gods needed places to live and so they would build temples. So every little community would build temples to their gods and they would bring in food to sacrifice because the gods were homeless and the gods were hungry. And that's what you would did. The, the gods were needy. And so you would, you would build a, a, a temple and, and, and you would make this wonderful little meal that you would bring in for the gods to make them happy. That was the beginning of happy meals right there. Make the, <laughs> make the little, little gods happy. We still do that, don't we? We go to the temple with the arches and never mind. <laughs> then... then the idea was, if I give the gods a place to live, and I give the gods the food they like, then the gods will give me what I want. And they will, give, they will help make me wealthy, or they will make me powerful and influential, or they will make me um, healthy so that my body is strong, or they will make me fertile so that I will have lots of children. And God had to teach the world that this was not the way things actually worked. They needed truth about God. There's not many gods. There's one God, and he's actually not needy. God wanted them to know that there was only one God, and he wanted them to know that God is completely loving and completely good. God doesn't exist with a need that he has to have filled by us. So that was a very unusual concept. People had to be taught this. And, and you might say, oh, I'm so glad I don't live in days like that or in countries where that still happens because we, we don't do that, that many gods thing. Are you sure? Because I, I think 
We haven't eliminated that concept of many gods or of sacrificing to those gods to get what we want. How about the person who's kind of a compulsive gambler? They will sacrifice everything in their bank account and their financial well-being just so they can enjoy the risk of putting money on the table or the possibility of a big windfall that they didn't actually earn. And they'll sacrifice a lot for that. Or how about the person who goes into the office super early every day and stays late every single day? And uh, we have a word for that. We call them a work, yeah, a workaholic. And they will sacrifice their relationship with their kids and with their spouse and with their friends just to climb the corporate ladder. For them, that, that, that idol is success. That God is success. I will sacrifice because if I get success, then I will get what I really want. Or how about an athlete? They will inject stuff into their body that they know will destroy it later on just so they have an advantage and serve the idol of winning or the idol of more money. And they will do that to themselves. Or how about the person who will sacrifice their own health and their safety through alcohol and through drugs and all they're trying to get is the acceptance of their peers or to escape a problem. And they'll just keep making that little sacrifice all the time. And I know what you're thinking right now. Oh, those are bad things and people, people shouldn't sacrifice that. But you know what? You can sacrifice to things that are considered good too. I think everybody here would say family is good. And what I could tell you is, you can make your family into an idol. And you can sacrifice to them, not just for them. And this is how you'll know what's happened to you. Because when they walk away or they don't give you what you want, you don't just feel disappointed. You're devastated. That person is not in your life, and now you feel like your life is over. It's not just hard. It's over. You've turned a good thing into a God thing. And now you have sacrificed and it has not delivered. Sacrifices to idols didn't stop in the ancient world. It still happens today. And here's what we, this verse comes crashing into our lives. This is not the kind of sacrifice that God desires. God is not asking you to sacrifice the very things he's given to you to enjoy, to try to get the things your heart actually craves. This is something we have to work through. It's not the sacrifice that he desires. So what he tells us is that when we live like that, what we're actually doing is we're sacrificing what he has given to us to lesser or unworthy gods. And this means that there's something wrong inside of us. There's something broken. And when you tell people that, they do not go, oh, thank you for that insight. That, that makes it all clear now. They get angry at you. They're offended. Which brings us to our second point. First, remember, if we want to get rid of guilt, we need one God. If you have many gods, you're going to have lots of guilt. We need one God. Secondly, is we need to identify the one problem, and the one problem is sin. Just uh, if you want to have a little experiment sometime, go around and ask people all through the day, what do you think is wrong with the world? And listen to what they tell you. And they'll tell you it's a political leader. They'll tell you it's a political party. They'll tell you that it's poverty, it's injustice, it's economic inequity, it's uh, uh, nuclear weapons, it's, it's food distribution, it's climate change. I mean, everybody's got a, a, an opinion about this. And this is what nobody ever says. Everybody always says the problem is out there. Nobody ever says the problem is in here. Nobody ever says that. But sin is an internal reality to each and every person. There aren't any exceptions to this. We all have things that we desire. Many of those things are good things. But we also have moments when we don't trust God to provide them for us. The very first sin was based on the fact that two people thought, you know what? I think God is holding out. I think he's holding something back. I think he has an agenda that's not exactly perfect for me. And if I'm going to get what's really good, I'm going to have to violate God to get there. And this is what we have to understand. This is what we need to hear. 
is that we have to attack the heart of God before we ever break the rules of God. We have to be suspicious that he's really trying to limit our lives in some way. And so sin begins when we think that God is holding out or hurting us in some way. And sin is when I am willing to sacrifice my life for something that's unworthy. This is something that's bound up in each of us. Sin causes me to hurt the people that I actually love. Sin causes me to be passive and apathetic in times when I could actually do something to make a difference. Sin is the sacrifice we make to unworthy gods. And we're good at hiding this internal brokenness. I, I can, everybody looks wonderful here today. And I can look at you and go, oh, these are wonderful people. And you are. But you've got something that's broken inside of you too. And it's not obvious. But there are times when it becomes obvious. If it gets too quiet and you're too alone, that will frustrate you. We need a certain amount of distraction in our lives to keep from being pulled into this. And then there's always the situation that seems perfectly fine to us in our own minds until suddenly it's publicly exposed and then we see it how everybody else does. This is inside of us. That brings us to the next part. If we want to deal with guilt in our lives, we have to have one God. We need to realize there's only one real problem, and that's sin. And then we need one real solution, and that's the cross. Jesus came and he proclaimed the kingdom of God. What he was telling us is that the time had come when there was the ability to live in the presence of God and with the power of God. And that God was actually not needy. He wasn't asking us to provide what he needs. He did not come to take. He came to give. That's a very different thing. The, you know it. It's, it's the most famous verse of Scripture in all the Bible, right? God so loved the world that he... Yes. But how many times do you hear people th say that God took something from them? So wherever God's will is being done, that's where God's kingdom is extended. It's not a geographic. You don't see it on a map. It's just wherever people are doing God's will, his kingdom is present. And you might think that this would be wonderful and everybody would be thrilled about this, except that they're not because there are lots of wills in our world and there are lots of kingdoms in our world and these kingdoms are in constant conflict with each other. How do kingdoms of the world deal with other kingdoms? Well, they try to control each other and they fight for that control and they will use violence and they will use force and they will intimidate and they will manipulate and they will do whatever is necessary to impose their will because they honestly believe their will is better than anybody else's will in the world. So when Jesus announced a new kingdom and that God's will had come, there were lots of people go, yeah, that's, I'm not interested because they already had their gods. And they already knew what they wanted. And they were already making their sacrifices. So what did they do to this new message and the person preaching it? They brutally attacked him. And here's Jesus. He's the king of all the kings. And this is astonishing. He refuses to destroy the people that he came to save. He won't power up. He won't do it. Jesus did not come to break your will. He came to win your heart. That's the difference. And you cannot win the heart of people by forcing them, by exercising violence against them, or by destroying them. You cannot win someone over by overpowering them. So Jesus comes into this broken world on a mission. And his weapons for his conflict with all the kingdoms of this world are going to be love and mercy. And you're thinking to yourself, he can't win this. If you say evil things or curse this guy, he blesses you in return. If you slap him on the face, he turns the other cheek. 
If you take his shirt away from him, he offers his coat also. Do you see it? These are not just rules. This is Jesus' battle plan. This is how you prove that evil cannot triumph over good. This is how you prove that grace is actually greater than guilt. This is how you prove that healing is more contagious than disease or light is greater than darkness. It's not by destroying. It's by proving that you are greater than all of it. And that's what Jesus comes to do. So that's why the cross is so essential because no one saw this coming. God would subject himself to all of the evil and all of the violence and all the injustice and all of the hate. And this is what the cross tells us. When people are doing their very worst against the Son of God, God is saying, whatever you do, I will not stop loving you. Take your best shot. Give your very worst. And he won't destroy us. He will not sacrifice us. He will sacrifice himself. This is the connection between heaven and earth. Remember that concept about connection. This is the connection. Earth is giving its worst at the very moment that heaven is giving its best. And there's a great transfer that occurs. That's going to happen. Jesus isn't just taking punishment. He's defeating the very things that are assaulting him because love is greater. And Jesus is about to transfer. He doesn't just, we don't just transfer our sin on him. He transfers his life to us. And so his glorious, perfect, without blemish, blameless, righteous life at the cross is transferred to us. That's what he does. I know we want forgiveness that costs us nothing, but please hear me. Forgiveness that costs us nothing isn't worth anything. And God is going to pay the cost. If you've ever wondered, that's why our church family exists. And that's why every church family exists. Because we want to help every single person discover that we have a God, one God, who overcomes evil with good, and he overcomes hatred with love, and he offers himself as a sacrifice so that we can connect with him and so that he can transfer grace and righteousness into our lives. That's why we're here. So now, we don't offer sacrifices. We offer thank offerings. Because God did not try to get you to do something for him because you felt guilty. He wanted you to do something for him because you felt grateful. There's a world of difference between those two things. He rescued us because he is good, not because we are good. And at the cross, God shows what he truly values. It's you. The cross is the place where you and I meet God. Now, here's the thing. I wish I could tell you that once you grasp this, you will never have a guilty thought again as long as you live. But how many have already figured out that probably isn't true? And uh, here's what I want you to know. When your guilt comes out of remission, you can remind your guilty thought that a great connection has been made in the cross of Christ and a great transfer has occurred and God took all our sin upon him and he gave us all of his life. And if that transfer was good enough for God, shouldn't it be good enough for us? Now, what I love about David is he doesn't ask for a second chance. Have you ever heard this with people who get caught and get in trouble? No? 23 minutes in and you're already quiet. That's good. <laughs> Just give me a second chance. And you know what God knows? If he gives you a second chance, you will even feel more guilty because you will blow that too. He hasn't come to give us another chance. He's come to give us a new heart. And that's how change occurs. It's found in Psalm 51. Create in me a, what's the next two words? Pure heart. David just got caught in the worst sin of his life. 
And if he were like us, if his understanding of God was the same as our understanding, he would just be standing before God and saying, God, please give me another chance. I'll do better. That's not what he says because he knows his heart and he knows his temptations and he knows his weaknesses. And so he just says, God, give me a pure heart and renew a steadfast spirit in me. And if we allow God to do that, it changes everything. Let's bow our heads this morning. I'm not suggesting that the things that we have done don't matter. They matter greatly. I'm not suggesting that the things that we've lived for are always worthy. They haven't been in my life, and I don't think I'm unusual in that regard. But this is what I can tell you, is that God didn't just see the incredible damage that sin could do in our lives. He saw the incredible damage that shame can do as well. And for him, it was unacceptable that his children would have to live forever in that condition. So he invades our world to tell us, you don't need a million gods, you don't need to make a million sacrifices, that at the end of the day, sacrificing what you have to get what you crave never gets you what you need. That there's one God, and he's not needy. There's one God, and he's completely good. There's one God, and he's completely holy. There's one God, and he has come to earth with one mission, and that is to eradicate the sin and the shame that has bound us up and is eating our lives away from the inside out. And on the cross, he just takes it. He just takes it, and he transfers life to us, and that's available to you today. Well, how, does, how does that happen? It happens when you admit, I'm not a perfect person. It happens when you acknowledge, I've given up stuff that God gave me in order so I could get something that I thought God was withholding from me. It happens when we turn a good thing into a God thing. And what God says, if you're willing to acknowledge that, if you're willing to hand your sins and shame over to me, I'm willing to hand life and righteousness over to you. So would you please repeat this prayer with me this morning? Heavenly Father, I'm not just asking for a second chance. I'm asking for a new heart. I'm asking for a steadfast spirit. I trust you to do this in me. In Jesus' name. Would you stand with me this morning?